stimulates chemical changes in what is called the visual purple in the rods of the retina. The effect of this stimulus then moves along the visual nerve to the brain, where further physical processes take place. If we could actually observe this happening, we would simply see physical processes like those that take place anywhere else in the external world. But if we are able to observe the ether body, we will perceive how a physical process taking place in the brain is also a life process. However, the sensation of the blue color that the recipient of the light rays experiences is still nowhere to be found, it only comes about in the recipient's soul. If the recipient's constitution consisted only of the physical body and the ether body, sensation could not take place. The activity through which sensation becomes a fact fundamentally differs from the working of the formative life force and elicits from it an inner experience. Without this activity, our response to external stimuli would be nothing more than mere life process such as those we observe in plants. Picture human beings receiving impressions from all sides. Our sensations respond to all these impressions, so we also picture ourselves as the source of the sentient activity described above, which moves out in all the directions from which we receive impressions. We will call this source of activity the sentient soul. It is just as real as the physical body. If a person stands before me and I disregard his or her sentient soul, imagining that person merely as a physical body, it is as if I were imagining a painting as nothing more than its canvas. The Essential Nature of the Human Being 39 With regard to perceiving the sentient soul, we must say something similar to what was said earlier about the ether body. Our bodily organs are blind to the sentient soul, and so is the organ by which life can be perceived as life, by which the ether body can be perceived. But by means of a still higher organ, the inner world of sensations can become a particular kind of supersensible perception. As we develop this organ, we become able not only to sense the impressions of the physical and ether worlds, but also to see the sensations as such. At that point, another being's world of sensations is spread out before us like any outer reality. We must differentiate between experiencing our own world of sensations and perceiving that of someone else. Of course anyone can look into his or her own personal world of sensations, but only a seer with an open, spiritual eye can see the inner sensations of another being. Unless we are seers, we can know the world of sensation only as something within ourselves, as the personal and hidden experiences of our own souls, but when our spiritual eye is open, what otherwise lives hidden inside another being shines forth, accessible to our outward-looking spiritual gaze. To avoid misunderstanding, it should be expressly stated that a seer does not inwardly experience the content of the inner worlds of sensations belonging to other beings. These beings experience their perceptions and sensations from their own inner points of view, while the seer perceives a manifestation or expression of each one's world of sensations. 21. 22, 40 Theosophy, 23, 24. In its functioning, the sentient soul is dependent on the ether body, but as it draws from the ether body what it then allows to light up as sensation. And since the ether body is the light within the physical body, the sentient soul is indirectly dependent on the physical body as well. Only a properly functioning and well-formed eye makes accurate color sensations possible. This is how the bodily nature affects the sentient soul.
The sentient soul is thus determined and restricted in its activity by the physical body, and lives within the limits set by our bodily nature. That is, the physical body, which is built up out of mineral substances and enlivened by the ether body, in turn sets the limits for our sentient soul. Those who possess the above-mentioned organ for seeing, the sentient soul therefore recognize it is having limits set by the body. However, the boundaries of the sentient soul do not coincide with those of the material physical body. The sentient soul extends beyond the physical body, even though the force that determines its limits proceeds from the physical body. This means that still another distinct member of the human constitution inserts itself between the physical and ether bodies on the one hand and the sentient soul on the other. This is the sentient or soul body. To say it another way, a portion of the ether body is finer than the rest, and this finer part forms a unity with the sentient soul, while the coarser part forms a kind of unity with the physical body. However, the sentient soul extends beyond the soul body. For simplicity's sake, we have chosen the term, sentient soul, which is related to, sensing. But in fact, sensing. The essential nature of the human being 41, is only one aspect of the soul's being. Our feelings of pleasure and displeasure, our drives, instincts and passions, are all very close to our sensations. They are all similarly private and individual in character and similarly dependent on our bodily nature. Our sentient soul interacts with thinking, with the spirit, just as it does with the body. To begin with, thinking serves the sentient soul, we formulate thoughts about our sensations and thus explain the outer world to ourselves. For instance, a child who has been burned thinks about it and arrives at the conclusion that fire burns. We do not blindly pursue our drives, instincts and passions, we think about them, thus creating opportunities to gratify them. This is the direction taken by our material culture, which is the sum of the services rendered to the sentient soul by thinking. Vast amounts of thought power are directed toward this end. Thought power has created ships, railroads, telegraphs and telephones, all things that for the most part serve to satisfy the needs of sentient souls. We have seen how the formative life force pervades the physical body. In a similar way, thought power pervades the sentient soul. The formative life force connects the physical body to its ancestors and descendants and thus places it in the context of natural laws having nothing to do with mere minerals. Similarly, Thought power gives the soul a place within a system of laws to which it does not belong as mere sentient soul. 25. 42 Theosophy Through the sentient soul, we are related to the animals, in whom we can also recognize the presence of sensations, drives, instincts and passions. Animals, however, Follow these up directly without interweaving them with independent thoughts that transcend immediate experience. Point six. This is also the case to a certain extent with less developed human beings. As such, therefore, the sentient soul is different from the more highly evolved part of the soul that places thinking in its service. We may call this soul, which is served by thinking, the mind soul. 6. Spiritual scientific statements must be taken very exactly, because they are of value only if the ideas are expressed precisely. For example, take the sentence, animals follow these perceptions, instincts, 
etc. up directly without interweaving them with independent thoughts that go beyond their immediate experience. If the modifiers, independent, and, that go beyond their immediate experience, are not fully taken into account, it would be easy to make the mistake of assuming that what is meant here is that no thoughts are present in the sensations and instincts of animals. However, true spiritual science is based on the recognition that the inner experience of animals, like everything else in existence, is permeated with thoughts, although these thoughts are not those of an independent, I, living within each animal. Instead, they belong to a collective animal ego that must be seen as a being that governs the individual animals from outside. This collective ego, unlike the human, I, is not present in the physical world but works on the animals from the soul world described on PP. 93 FF. Further details may be found in an outline of occult science by this author. The point here is that in human beings, thoughts acquire an independent existence, that is, we can have a direct soul experience of them as thoughts rather than experiencing them indirectly in sensation. The Essential Nature of the Human Being 43 The mind-soul permeates the sentient soul. Anyone who possesses the organ form, seeing, the soul will see the mind-soul as an entity distinct from the mere sentient soul.7. Through thinking, we are led beyond our own personal lives, we acquire something that extends beyond our own souls. We take it as a matter of course that the laws of thinking correspond with the universal order. We can feel at home in the universe because this correspondence exists, and it is a weighty factor in learning to recognize our own essential nature. We seek the truth in our soul, through this truth, not only the soul but also the things of the world express themselves. Truth recognized through thinking has an independent significance, which refers to the things of the world and not merely to our own souls. In my delight in the starry heavens, I am living inside myself. But the thoughts that I formulate about the orbits of the heavenly bodies have the same meaning for anyone else's thinking as they have for mine. It would be. 7. Translator's Note. It is important to note that Rudolf Steiner here uses both the terms for standaseal, mind-soul or rational soul, and genuseal heart and mind soul, even equating Verstandesiel with that untranslatable German concept, Gemit. In this context, the relationship of the mind soul to Gemit even in its non-anthroposophical usage, warm-heartedness, kindly disposition, as well as to the newly paid comfort, coziness, is apparent. 26. 27. 44 Theosophy Senseless to speak of, my, delight and pleasure if I myself were not present, but it is not at all senseless to talk about my thoughts without reference to me as a person. The truth I think today was also true yesterday and will be true tomorrow, even though it occupies my mind only for today. If understanding something gives me pleasure, this pleasure is meaningful only as long as it is active in me, but the truth of the understanding has a significance totally independent of my pleasure. In grasping the truth, the soul links up with something that possesses intrinsic value, a value that neither appears nor disappears with the soul's perception of it. The real truth neither comes into being nor passes away, its significance cannot be destroyed. This is in no way contradicted by the fact that certain human truths are of only temporary value because they are recognized as partial or total errors in due time. We must realize that the truth, 
in itself, endures, even though our thoughts are only transient manifestations of eternal truths. Even if, like blessing, we say that we are content to strive eternally for the truth since the pure and perfect truth can surely exist only for God. This does not deny the eternal value of the truth, but rather confirms it point eight only something of eternal and intrinsic significance can evoke an eternal striving and be the object of an eternal search. If the truth were not wholly independent in itself, if its value and significance came from the feelings of human souls, then it could not be a goal agreed on by all. 8. God hold Ephraim Lessing, 1729-1781, German dramatist and critic. The essential nature of the human being 45. Humankind. The very fact that we all strive for it confirms its independent nature. This applies equally to what is truly good. What is morally right is independent of our inclinations and passions insofar as it does not submit to them but makes them submit to it. Desire and revulsion, likes and dislikes, are the property of each individual human soul. The beauty stands higher than likes and dislikes, sometimes standing so high in people's estimation that they will give up their lives for it. The more we have ennobled our inclinations, our likes and dislikes, so that they submit without force or compulsion to what we recognize as our duty, the higher we stand as human beings. What is morally right, like what is true, has an intrinsic eternal value that it does not receive from the sentient soul. By letting what is intrinsically true and good come to life within us, we rise above the mere sentient soul. The eternal spirit shines into the sentient soul, kindling in it a light that will never go out. To the extent that our soul lives in this light, it takes part in something eternal, which it links to its own existence. What the soul carries within itself is truth and goodness is immortal. We will call this eternal element that lights up within the soul the consciousness soul. We can speak of consciousness even in connection with the soul's lower stirrings. Even the most mundane sensation is already the object of consciousness, and to this extent animals must also be credited with having consciousness. But the very core of human consciousness, the soul within the soul, so to speak, is what? Consciousness. 28. 29. 46. Theosophy. Soul, means here. The consciousness soul is different from the mind soul, which is still entangled in sensations, drives, emotions and so forth. We all know how we accept our personal preferences is true, at first. But truth is lasting only when it has freed itself from any flavor of such sympathies and antipathies. The truth is true, even if all our personal feelings revolt against it. We will apply the term, consciousness soul, to that part of the soul in which truth lives. 30. Thus the soul, like the body, consists of three distinct members, the sentient soul, the mind soul, and the consciousness soul. Just as our bodily nature works from below upwards to set limits on the soul, spirituality works from above downwards to expand it. The more our soul is filled with what is true and good, the broader and more inclusive its eternal aspect becomes. For anyone who can see the soul, the glow that proceeds from a human being whose eternal aspect is expanding is as real as a flame's radiant light as to the physical eye. To the seer, the visible bodily person is only a part of the whole human being, the coarsest structure in the midst of others that interpenetrate it in each other. 
the ether body is a life form fills out the physical body, and beyond the ether body we can distinguish the soul body or astral form projecting outward on all sides. Extending beyond this is the sentient soul, and then the mind soul that grows ever larger as it takes in ever more of the true and the good. If people live solely out of their own inclinations, likes and dislikes, the boundaries of their mind souls would coincide with those of their sentient souls. The Essential Nature of the Human Being 47 This formation, in the midst of which the physical body can be seen as if in a cloud, can be called the human aura. When the essential nature of the human being is seen in the way that this book attempts to describe, it is supplemented and enriched by the measure of the aura. In the course of our early development, a moment arrives when, for the first time in our lives, each of us experiences him or herself as an independent being face to face with the rest of the world. For sensitive people, this is a significant experience. In his autobiography, the poet Jean Paul recounts this moment. Although I have never told anyone about it, I will never forget the experience of being present at the birth of my self-awareness. I can tell you the place and time exactly. One morning when I was a very small child, I was standing in the front door looking toward the woodpile on the left, when suddenly the inner vision, I am an eye, struck me like a lightning bolt from heaven. It has gone on shining ever since. My eye had seen itself for the first time and for all time. It is almost inconceivable that my memory could deceive me on this point since no one else ever told me anything about it that I might have added to. It was an incident that took place failed in my human holiest to holies, and it's very. 31. 48 Theosophy. Novelty gave permanence to the mundane circumstances surrounding it. Point 9. We all know that little children refer to themselves by saying things like, Charlie's a good boy, or, Mary wants that, and we find it appropriate that they should speak about themselves as they would about someone else, since they are not yet aware of their own independent existence. Consciousness of self has not yet been born in them. Point one zero through this consciousness of self, an individual achieves self-definition as an independent being, separate from everything else, as, I. By, I, a person means the total experience of his or her being as body and soul. Body and soul are the vehicles of the, I, it works in them. Just as the physical body has its center in the brain, the soul has its center in the, I. Our sensations are stimulated from outside, our feelings assert themselves as effects of the outer world, our will relates to. 9. Jean-Paul Friedrich Richter, 1763-1825. He first described this experience in Warheit aus Jean Paul's Leben. Kindheit's Geschick von IHM Self Geschrieben, the true story of Jean Paul's life, a childhood autobiography, three books in two volumes, Breslau, 1826-1828, Book 1, P. 53. 10. We have noted that little children refer to themselves in the third person. What is important here is not how early children use the word, I, but at what point they can connect the appropriate idea with the word. Children may well hear the word from adults and then use it without grasping the idea, I. In general, however, they start to use the word relatively late, and this in itself points to an important fact of development, namely that the idea, I, 
gradually unfolds out of a vague feeling of I. The essential nature of the human being 49. The outer world by manifesting in outward directed actions. R. I. However, our actual individual essence remains invisible. It is very telling that Jean Paul describes becoming aware of his I. S. An incident, veiled in the human holiest of holies, because we are each totally alone with our own I. This I is the self of each human being. We are justified in seeing that I as our true being, and may therefore describe body and soul as the garments in which we live, as the bodily conditions under which we act. In the course of our development we learn to use these instruments more and more as servants of our I. This little word, I, as it is used in our language, is a name different from all other names. Appropriate reflection on the nature of this name opens up an approach to understanding human nature in a deeper sense. Any other name can be applied to the corresponding object by all of us in the same way. Everyone can call a table, table, and a chair, chair. But this is not the case with the name, I. No one can use it to mean someone else. Each of us can only call him or herself, I. The name, I, if it designates me, can never reach my ear from outside. The soul can only designate itself as I from within, through itself. Thus, when we say I to ourselves, something begins to speak in us that has nothing to do with any of the worlds from which the above mentioned garments are taken. The I gains an ever-increasing mastery over body and soul, and this is expressed in a person's aura. The greater the mastery, the more differentiated, complex and richly colored the aura becomes. How the I affects the aura is 50 Theosophy Visible to the seer, but the I itself is not, it is truly Veiled in the human holiest of holies. The I takes in the rays of the light that shines as eternal light in each human being. Just as we gather up experiences of body and soul in the I, we also allow thoughts of truth.
Thank you.